Thank you, Steve. So good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Bagwadia, founder and CEO at Nirmata. Like Steve mentioned, we are a partner with Cisco. We provide microservices operations and management uh, on Cisco InterCloud as well as integrations with UCSD and ICFD. So quick, uh, you know, a little bit about my background. Um, so I'm a software developer for the majority of the last couple of decades. And, you know, my focus, my area of, you know, I guess my passion has been on large-scale distributed systems. So today what we're going to do in terms of an agenda is we're going to first start with why microservices have suddenly become the, the hot new buzzword in application development. Uh, then we're going to try and put a definition on microservices. So there's lots of definitions floating around there, lots of articles and blogs, uh, but let's try and come to some consensus or understanding of what this really means. And after that, we'll dive into some application development or microservices patterns on the design and architecture side. So first off, let's start with you know uh, just a little bit of level set of what's been going on in the IT and technology stack overall, right? So we all know that infrastructure is now being delivered as a service on the compute network storage security side, whether you're building private clouds or public clouds. We've also seen this major shift in how data technologies, databases, uh, are being operated, built, and you know, released, where you have many different you know, types of data sources for mobile, big data, et cetera. And finally, and what we're going to focus on today is the shift in the application tier, uh, where now you have services being built at, or applications being built as microservices and packaged at runtime in container technologies like Docker. So the whole reason for this, and there's a, you know, there's a little bit of a history why, uh, why we came about to this, but it's because microservices allows companies and businesses to be extremely agile at scale. And if you think about it in the past, we've had you know, small companies, small businesses uh, have always been able to deliver faster. But then the software grows, the team grows, the size of your infrastructure grows, and things start slowing down. Microservices is a solution, it's a way to solve that for application delivery, and that's what we're gonna see of how it does that and why that's important. So let's talk about agility first. So like we were discussing, if you are providing you know, a large monolith application, today what ends up happening is it's, you go through a release train where you have your build cycle, you have your test and QA cycle, uh, and, and then you might have the software sitting perhaps in staging for a few months before it gets to a customer. So any small bug fix may take three months, six months to get out to your customers. If you go to microservices, the idea is you're breaking up your large application into small individual components. And you can have in your organization smaller teams working on these components, and they're going to be able to deliver that much quicker all the way through production. So companies like Netflix, LinkedIn, Facebook, they've all moved from this monolith style application to microservices to be able to, you know, even at scale, be able to deliver faster to their customers. So that's the agility part of it. And this allows you know, businesses to scale in terms of the size of the teams and still have smaller teams work independently uh, on different areas of their code. The next side of this is let's talk about how microservices come into focus even as you scale the, the size of your deployment, the size of your application itself. So here I'm going to you know, quote from, there's a great book on scalability um, from a consulting company called AKF. These are three guys who started, were the early team members at eBay PayPal, and, and they have something they published called the Scale Cube. So basically what they're saying here is any application you have, there's three ways you can scale that application. The first dimension you can scale that application, and I think this we're all familiar with, is you can start replicating the entire application and you scale up you know, each server in terms of memory, compute, et cetera, right? So you put a load balancer in front of this application and now you have multiple copies of your entire monolith and you give it each one the right CPU, the right memory. The next way you can scale an application is you can split it up into smaller components. 
So in this case, maybe you have a catalog service or a catalog component running on one server, and you have some other components running on another server, and you now can individually size and deploy them uh, as you need to. So that gives you one other way of you know, controlling how you scale up your uh, larger application. And the final way of scaling is if you look at your data set itself, so let's say you have an extremely large catalog, you can start splitting it up uh, across your data plane. So perhaps you know, some set, subset of your products go to one server, uh, the other subset go to another server, and that gives you the third way of scaling. Now, Putting this all together and looking at where microservices get interesting, so microservices combine XY scaling, or maybe it's more like YX scaling, because what they do is first you're splitting your application into these smaller services, and each service can now also independently scale up and down um, without having to you know, impact the other services. So microservices provide you know, the best way to be able to efficiently use your resources. And going back to the scale cube, what they talk about going to almost near infinite scalability, because you can keep decomposing your monolith application, and you can keep scaling up these services independently as you need to. So it gives a lot of flexibility. It also is a very, very much a more efficient way to use your resources, because uh, now you just scale up the right components of the application. So let's put this all together into a quick definition of what this really means, right? So the way I think about it, microservices is all about decomposing your large application into smaller cooperating services. And it's important that these service, each one is designed to be elastic, so the, yeah, you can scale them up and down individually like we were discussing. Each service is also designed to be resilient. So if a single instance of that service fails, other services are designed to be stateless and can quickly start you know, accepting requests for that service. And very importantly, each service is designed to be composable through uniform APIs so that they are working together as one entire application rather than just discrete uh, services itself. And the micro part of this is to try and make each service as minimal as possible, but yet complete in what they provide. So it's important now, these are two constraints which are at opposing ends, because you want to make these services small, but if you make them too small, then perhaps they'll introduce dependencies to other services, which, which creates problems as you're deploying this into your production system. So now that we have looked at a little bit about the history of microservices and why businesses have adopted these uh, for agility and scale, and also we talked about, we, uh, about a definition of this, let's switch to discussing some design patterns uh, as well as look at the architecture. So the first pattern, and this may be a little bit ironic, the, but I want to talk about is the monolith pattern itself, right? So there's nothing wrong with developing and operating a monolith. It, it's really about what, you know, what's best for your business and does it prevent you from deploying faster, from being more agile. And again, think about this from an organization perspective as well as at scaling uh, on the size of your application itself. There's also, you know, there's good reasons why you might want to always start as a monolith but keep things very modular, very loosely coupled within your application and then over time evolve to microservices. It's also possible to automate the deploys of your monolith. And in fact, one good best practice is if you're thinking about application containers like Docker or other CoreOS's Rocket or other containers, you might want to even containerize your monolith as a first step, get familiar with that uh, automation, and, and then look at going towards microservices. So we already talked about what microservices are, but I want to point out a couple of interest, other interesting things that they enable uh, as a design pattern or as an architectural pattern itself, right? So again, in a microservices application, you have these cooperating services which are loosely coupled, which are interacting through APIs, but also as these evolve, now you can, you know, you can make experimental services at a smaller scale. 
Perhaps you want to choose a different data technology for a one service, but keep your relational database for the other services. This architecture and this style lets you do that, whereas if you had a monolith, you have to make a larger decision, which involves bigger organizations, more teams, uh, as well as impacts the entire application. So this really gives uh, what developers love about microservices is it gives them the flexibility to experiment, make small changes, test them out, and then propagate them to the rest of the system if that change makes sense. Or you can, of course, back it out and you know, do something else there. Before we go into more patterns, I want to kind of introduce a way of uh, categorizing or how we think about these microservices patterns, right? So Gary O'Leaf, who is a senior research director at Gartner, he has this very interesting report where he talks about the inner architecture and the outer architecture for microservices style applications. And what he says is, with microservices, the whole focus is that you're keeping each service as simple as possible, but the complexity has to go somewhere, right? It's kind of like with a squishy balloon, you squeeze it on one end, it's gonna rise on the other end. So similarly, if you're pushing out the complexity from each service, what's happening is it's moving into the interactions across services, and in fact, that complexity has to be absorbed by a layer of tooling. So microservices are simple, simpler to develop, but they are more complex to operate because you have many more components, many more things to manage, many more things to scale, and they require a lot of automation. So think about, he calls this the inner and the outer architecture, where the outer architecture being the platform, the operation side of it, and the inner being each simple service. And as we look at these other few patterns, let's you know, think about the inner and the architect or outer implications of these patterns. So the first pattern, and this is something every distributed computing technology has had, is something to do with naming, registration, and discovery, right? So if those of you who are familiar with things like Corba or DCOM or even SNMP, all of these have a way of naming things, finding things within an application, and also connecting to different things. With microservices, the challenge becomes because each, now your application has several services, maybe hundreds of services, and each service could have several runtime instances, how do you, you know, figure out if you have a particular service, where is it running, which IP address and port, and how does a client, internal or external, connect with it? So the idea behind this pattern is to you know, be able to register instances as well as then discover them. The next pattern over here is something we call the service gateway. It's also called an API gateway or a request router. And now because you have, again, several services which are behind the scenes in your application, you need to provide a front end where clients are viewing these applications as a single endpoint, right? So this could be based on devices like Say you're building a video streaming service, it may be based on device type. If you're building a shopping service like this example is showing, it may be based on you know, just your API endpoint or your UI that you're building for your website. So what this does, and again, this is intended to be an outer architecture pattern, is you are able to insert an API gateway, which is doing the load balancing, the routing at the application tier to your backend components and services. Another outer architecture pattern is something called mid-tier load balancing. And this is interesting because we all know load balancers as in, you know, whether it's an FI or a Netscaler or others, but in here, it's application level load balancing, usually done for REST APIs with some sort of HTTP load balancer. And the idea is that developers, as you're spinning up services, as you're spinning up components, each you know, of your component may need to, one service may need to find some other service and may want to you know, interact and talk to these services. So to do that, you need a real scale out uh, type of load balancer uh, provided, and that's usually done through software. Again, it's an outer architecture pattern where if you're selecting a microservices platform, or if you're looking at solutions like Netflix OSS and others, this is something that you want to provide to your developers to make sure uh, that they can you know, scale out and interconnect their services. So let's switch now to some inner architecture patterns, right? And this is where I'm gonna talk about things that developers would have to now start changing or do uh, if they are developing distributed microservices style applications. 
So the first thing is, if you have multiple instances of anything, you're going to have to coordinate act activities across these instances. So let's say here if you have a catalog service, and perhaps every you know, five minutes you're uh, doing some batch tasks to clean up like old items in the catalog. In cases like this, as you're working on one entry, or if you're doing some account management, other services, other instances of that same service need to know that somebody's already doing that. So typically that's done through taking a distributed lock, much like you would in a tip application where you take an in-memory lock, this is doing a, a distributed lock. So there are tools like Zookeeper and Curator which, again, which allow uh, this to happen, but this means you're going to need additional tools deployed so that you can do these distributed locking type of mechanisms. Another similar pattern, which is a variation on locking, is something called leader election. So you're, if you have routine tasks, things to do, uh, batch processing, and you only want a leader, uh, every few minutes maybe you want to run a leader election, see who's available to perform that, and then have one of that, those tasks designated the leader, and it can do that particular you know, cleanup. So say maybe there's some you know, a, a transfers that has to happen for data, things like that. You don't want all instances of your services trying to do this at the same time. So that's what this pattern solves. And Zookeeper is an ex excellent source. There's other uh, open source tools. There's other also libraries out there which allow you to do this. One last inner architecture pattern that I'm going to mention is something called distributed workflows, which actually builds on top of the prior, uh, prior two. So let's say you have a complex you know, uh, provisioning task that you want to do. We all know through orchestration tools you can program workflows, but what if you need to you know, do this in code? So let, you want to deploy an entire environment, and perhaps you know, as part of deploying that, there's several tasks which need to be coordinated, things only need to be happen you know, at the right sequence, and when the right dependency conditions are met. So a distributed workflow lets you build these type of tasks, where you can have, you know, you can uh, design your entire workflow, or you can have one of your leaders actually, you know, uh, develop that workflow, and then the rest of the task can be spread across all available instances. So all three of these patterns are meant to, you know, at scale. Now you can spread workloads and tasks across available instances, um, but still keep the right distributed provisioning and control with this. So let's you know, recap what we have looked at in terms of you know, both microservices uh, patterns as well as you know, what we are looking at for um, some of the next uh, in, in terms of the architecture and the, the motivation for this. So to quickly summarize the key points and something to you know, think about, microservices they came about first it was for scale and but it was also for agility which is you know the main reason for why enterprises are looking at these now so microservices let you be agile at scale even as your team sizes grow even as your software sizes grow which is something which was not possible to do before with monolith type applications However, microservices do push a lot of complexity into the platform layer, into the underlying you know, tooling layer. So this is, uh, you need to be aware of this as you're evolving to microservices. It's probably better to start with a monolith, get your automation in place there, and, and then move to microservices at the right time. And the other thing to know is if you're going to microservices, and today perhaps you know, every application on the internet becomes a distributed application, but especially so with microservices, you are going to have to do things like you know, what we talked about with distributed locking, uh, with leader elections, and other types of workflow coordination across multiple services in your, in, in, within one application itself. So that's all I had for the main content. Um, I do want to point out a few things. Uh, so we do have other sessions on containers and microservices. Uh, some, all of these are in your session catalog. We're also doing a demo on everything I talked about with you know, the, some of these patterns. So we're in Cloud Pod 6 to your, I guess, to your right over there. Um, so come visit us and you, know, you can see all of this in action. Try it out. Uh, we're showing Docker containers on UCS, ICFD, and uh, CCS, uh, Cisco InterCloud Services.
So some references for you know for you to look at. There's several other uh, it's not, uh, talks. So there's other talks happening here, like we talked about, but also out on the internet you could look for these. Um, and you know if you have any questions, of course we can take some of them now, and then I'll be at also the cloud demo pod for uh, for the rest of the day today. Okay, Jim, uh, thank you very much. That was a great job. Thank you. And uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Questions? Oh, we do have one. Hold on. Um, how would you differentiate microservices from, say, the enterprise service press architecture we had before, or Corb, right. DCOM? What makes microservices different? Right. Yeah, so great question, and just I'll repeat the question. So it was, what makes microservices different from ESBs, Corba, you know, SOA, perhaps, you know, service-oriented architecture, DCOM, all of these things that came, you know, before microservices, right? So in fact, you know, there there was a debate uh, on some public blogs about isn't microservices SOA uh, in another service-oriented architectures itself, and it is. All the principles of SOA are very applicable to microservices, but think about microservices as a subset of SOA, where you have some key constraints, like we talked about, in terms of how your you know services need to be elastic, resilient, and also composable within the application. To go back to on the ESB side, ESB architectures, and typically when you think about that, you think of a bus in the middle and components connected to this. So here there is no bus. The complexity, each service is simple, but now it's the network with REST APIs that's interconnecting this, uh, and you end up with direct connections across services. So it's getting rid of that bus, that's one of the big difference. Uh, So the, the outer architecture complexity you're talking about really is massive in that every component can talk to every other component right. and the interface definitions become really complicated because every component's got to have a new interface to every other component. Sure. So you do have to follow you know, good uh, design principles where your interfaces end up being stable. You have to manage versions. The outer uh, architecture part of it, so there the good news is there are tools, there are platforms which are solving this, like, my, like what Nirmata is doing with you know, CIS and other solutions. So you would have to, you, you need to make sure that you have that right tooling in place. And there's other projects like, you know, we talked about Magnum, I guess, in the previous session from OpenStack. Kubernetes is an open source project. There's, all of these are trying to address that outer uh, architecture complexity. The interface part of it is some which RESTful API design uh, addresses to a large degree also. But great questions. <laughs> okay, Jim, thank you very much again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve.